No, I'm right. down in Australia. Oh, the wow. Gold Coast. Yeah. And then Gareth, obviously and, in London. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And are you you're in Swansea still? Or are you? Uh, no, in London. Are you in London too? Okay, cool. Yeah. Where, whereabouts do you live? Uh, Pimlico. Oh, cool. Okay, nice. I'm just in Greenwich actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, cool. Hey, Emily, I hear you? it's um, nice and uh, rainy and windy there today. <laughs> it is. It's absolutely disgusting. I've got the lights oh. on. It's I see. Uh, that's why I was like, "What time is it there?" It's like I know. The it's so dark outside. <laughs> oh, <don't> act, <laughs> this is not unusual, though. This is London. <laughs> Nine yeah. <it's> dark. <laughs> <laughs> Quite incredible, really. What you do, it's uh, it's so exciting. Um, yeah. No. Exactly. And it's got really exciting recently because um, having spent ten years working on this issue, suddenly the whole world has kind of woken up. <clears throat> plastic pollution yeah and, um, i really want to see something about it um, yeah. wow cool. yeah. yeah i can imagine your name keeps on popping up in google searches and stuff now they're like oh we need to get this girl to talk <laughs> <laughs> my so. only worry actually was um i'm uh, there's supposed to be a parcel arriving at some point today no worries. that's cool is that okay that's yeah that's of, course. of course no no look we just edit it. that out yeah of yeah, course. yeah no no seriously like we, we okay. always we okay. always have these things people are like oh i need to run off or go to the bathroom or whatever the <laughs> yeah. kids can arrive or the dog comes and you know that's, that's uh, not a problem and um, so just on the sort of video versus audio bit yeah. it, are you just going to do one thing or are you going to do one piece for video and then one piece for audio separately yeah we we do yeah. separately yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's, no, the only reason I'm asking is I've got a few things here, like a ah, cool. sample from the oh, giant awesome. Awesome. and a shoe that's made out of ocean plastic. Ah, cool, oh, cool. cool. Wow. And, yeah, and no, so, so we do do a separate one, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. I was just so, making sure I'm not like, oh, like this. And, uh, no, and cool. So, yeah, if you, could, if you could explain it in a way that, you, that will suit both, that'll be really, really yeah. great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Amazing. It's always cool. Waking at dawn. Righty ho. Well, good morning there, Emily Penn. Thank you so much for joining us from a rainy London morning. Uh, and it's uh, so nice to see your face. Yeah, good morning. It's great to be chatting to you. Yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, we, we've been uh, chatting like, you know, on the side for a fair few months now. Uh, a, a common friend of ours, Sam Slipper, actually, um, she put me in touch with you or made me aware of you like ages ago. And she's like, you've got to speak to Emily. And, uh, yeah, since then, I guess we've been chatting a bit on the side and, and now finally we get to chat to you. So, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the ridiculously human podcast, uh, as a guest. Not at all. I'm sorry. It took so long to kind of get me in the country <laughs> to organize it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you've been on some amazing <laughs> adventures, which we're definitely going to get into on the podcast. Um, so yeah, but let's let's take it a little bit back if you don't mind. So you absolutely love sailing, obviously, and that started from a pretty young age. I think it was around about uh, five years old. Yeah. Uh, was sailing something that you loved like immediately? And uh, can you just take us back to that journey and how it all started? Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't remember that much of what you were thinking when you were about five. Um, but I, I <laughs> definitely did love the water growing up I just you couldn't keep me out um I loved snorkeling and swimming and sailing and um, I learned to sail on holiday down in Devon in cool. southwest England and I remember then um nagging my parents when we got home to South Wales to to let me do more sailing um so as soon as I was old enough I then started sailing and then quickly got into racing uh, which was a really kind of fun way as a kid and as a teenager to um, spend my weekends. Uh, yeah, cool. and, and you weren't just having a fun weekend. You were pretty darn good at sailing. And at 14, you got a place in the Welsh, Welsh squad and then you moved on to the British squad. So, yeah, what was it like, uh, the competitive side of things? And, uh, um, yeah, what does it take to be part of those teams? Yeah, I think for me, it was it was fun. You know, I, I loved being on the water. Um, I loved the racing side of it. I think it gave a little bit more purpose to getting out there on the water every day because you had a real kind of mission to get around the course and, um, and a really great community. You know, I got to travel all over the UK and to Europe a little bit as well, which I found really exciting, meeting new people um, and, and really kind of taking me away from the little small town that I grew up in. 
Yeah. And what's the training involved for like speed racing on, on boats? What, what, what do you want to call, what are they called? Like boats, yachts, uh, like J22s the... or I know I did a little bit back in the day, but. Yeah, no, much smaller than that. But you call them dinghies in the dinghies. UK. It's not a very glamorous term. But, uh, <laughs> it's basically sailing boats for one or two people. So the first boat I was in was an optimist, which is, and pretty much resembles a bathtub. Uh, it's, it's just a sort of like very square little boat. Um, and, you know, it's designed for sort of anywhere from five to 10 year olds. Um, oh, beautiful. And, and then you kind of move up, the boats get bigger and they get faster and wetter and more fun. And, you know, you end up sailing these kind of little skiffs with um, big spinnakers. And um, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're so close to the water, you feel like you're going really fast. Um, and I think there's something really nice about um, being in control of, um, you know, the vessel. And um, I think looking back um, where I kind of got my independence and my love for exploring and just kind of setting off into the unknown and um, probably goes right back to those days um, when I would kind of set off, um, whether it was onto a lake or a reservoir or out onto the ocean, <laughs> you know, at a really young age when the winds were howling and mm. somehow I knew what to do. I knew which way to go and, you know, who knows how or why. But um, there was something about that that really kind of gave me the independence that I have now. Yeah, one thing That's that you great. said there was control. And I remember when I, I did a little bit back in the day with one of my best mates, I never felt in control on a boat. So I was always like, <laughs> what is going to happen next? And, and often we ended up in the water and the spinnaker was there as well. And it was like, <laughs> it's definitely not as easy as it, as it might seem. Yeah, sure. No, yeah. There's a lot of wet moments. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and and so, so maybe you can also tell us a, a little bit about, say, your folks and your brother. Like, were they also into sailing? And or, or did, what sort of influence did they have on you um, growing up? Yeah, so my older brother also started sailing uh, just a little bit before me. So um, that definitely had a big influence on, you know, looking up to him and what I wanted to go and do. Um, my parents, uh, you'll kind of find this funny, that they actually met on a sailing boat in the South oh, Pacific. Wow. <laughs> wow that's so um, cool wow. a, a lot of, <laughs> i know a lot of people when they hear that they're like oh now it makes so much yeah. sense <laughs> but the really funny thing is when i grew up i didn't aspire to be a professional sailor um, or spend my life at sea i actually really wanted to be an architect which is uh -huh. what i then went and trained to do um but it's funny that you know when you look back at kind of where i came from and what my parents did when they were in their 20s Wow. Um, yeah, that's so that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Now, before we come back to your story about architecture, we had quite an important question. And it's about what happens when England comes up against Wales? Are you in the red or in the white rugby jersey? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny because um, although I probably wouldn't say like I'm Welsh kind of outwardly, I, would, I very much feel British. <laughs> Um, <laughs> when when it comes down to that question, I'm always in the red camp. Are you? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. It's, it's so funny. My, my dad uh, actually named me after Gareth Edwards. Um, <laughs> and because he was a, he was like one of the greatest like, Welsh rugby players ever. Yeah. During his time that, that I guess I was <laughs> my dad named him. So for some reason, I've always supported Wales as well. And like, even though Wales has beaten us the last four times we played them in rugby, I'm like, I don't mind. That's cool. I can lose to Wales because they're cool people and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you learn so, something new on this podcast every day, even for me. <laughs> oh, cool, man. That's good. But, um, so, so yeah, you mentioned your, you know, your love for architecture and that you always wanted to do that. Where did that love come from? I think, so I've always loved art and design from a really young age. And um, I started when I was about 15, 16, uh, keeping a sketchbook, like an art journal. Um, mm. And everywhere I go, I'd be kind of documenting what I was seeing visually. And I just loved that process of drawing and painting. And so then when it came to kind of choosing your A-levels and choosing where you wanted to go, what course you wanted to do at university, um, I really couldn't let go of the artistic side. 
Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, loved maths and science. And those were the subjects that came naturally to me. Uh, mm. So I was really looking for something that combined the two. And I think when you're um, a teenager, you kind of get presented with only so many options of what you can do with your life. And that was the one that ticked that box, both those boxes. Um, and so that became my kind of goal, really. Um, and it was absolutely the right course for me to do at university. Um, and I really believe I wouldn't be where I am today without following that path back then. Huh. It's a nice basis and one would argue quite well-rounded to have art and science uh, in one sort of uh, person. So that's, that's pretty interesting that architecture sort of fulfilled that for you, which makes a lot of sense. So you studied architecture at Cambridge University and then part of your research is um, what you had to do was you wanted to go to uh, Shanghai to research the eco cities, um, but you wanted to travel there without getting on the airplane. So how did that sort of come about? Yeah, so this was for my dissertation. Um, I heard about this eco city in Shanghai. And so um, because I'd always been very interested in the environment and conservation, um, I thought, right, this is my chance to go and learn a bit more about it. I think, to be honest as well, um, I was at that age um, and I think my nature was very much sort of like, oh, China, great a country that I don't know anything about. That sounds like a really great place to go and visit as a 19 year old. Um, so I thought, you know, I couldn't really uh, take a plane to go and study a zero carbon city. It just didn't make any sense. Um, so ended up <laughs> planning this journey, um, looking for ways to get there and ending up taking a train, a camel and a horse across Europe, Russia, Mongolia and down through China. No ways. Gee, that's amazing. So, so it, but is flying something that you're fearful of at all, or you just really like, like the adventure? Yeah. So it was all about the adventure and also kind of making the point, you know, of, of the sort of carbon footprint side of it back then. But it was, what was fascinating is on that journey, I just fell in love with this idea of traveling slowly mm -hmm. around the planet and getting to experience all those transitions, that subtle change in culture and climate and landscape and the people who I met all along the way. Um, and it was that journey that then got me even more excited about traveling without planes uh, because I think I was worried that I was gonna miss all of the bits in between. You know, when you're up there in the sky, you, you kind of can't, yeah. you're not connected to what's going on on the ground. Well, so you certainly, by flying, you certainly missed the camel and the, the horse. So out of the horse, the camel and the train, which was your favorite mode of transport? <laughs> um, I'll probably have to go with the train. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Mostly, close. mostly though, because um, it was fascinating. You know, we were kind of playing cards and um, drinking vodka. We are in Russia and uh, just generally meeting amazing people. And so it was just five weeks of conversation. And, and that's the thing, you know, people is what fascinates me. Um, mm. And that's the common thread through everything that I've ever worked on. Um, mm. and, and that was the opportunity on, on the train. Um, you know, every day a new person would get on and find out their story. Yeah, you, you definitely have like inspired me now to do that. And actually, if I think about it, like going back, I've always loved things like train trips. Definitely, I, I'd take a train over a flight any day. Road trips, road trips are the best. Like, and um, but actually, making a, a conscious effort to to get somewhere uh, without an aeroplane, um, something I'm gonna sort of make a make a mission of i guess in the future <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely yeah you and, discover and, so much more don't you yeah mm. yeah so so what was actually waiting for you when you got to shanghai yeah so not really what i expected actually and um, this eco city that i had gone to study they hadn't even broken ground on the site um <laughs> it was you know, kind of just a, a big media stunt, it seemed. Um, mm. And, you know, all of this talk, nothing actually happening. But um, it was that journey that I, I kind of didn't need the Eco City by the time I got there because I'd discovered something more fascinating that I wanted to write about. Mm -hmm. um, both from, from the journey, understanding the different types of architecture in different climates um, and in different landscapes as I went. And then the housing that I ended up living in in Shanghai 
um, was fascinating, both on a sort of geometry side of things in its relationship to the sun and the wind, um, but also the way people interacted and the scale of this housing um, that really facilitated a really rich community um, that these new cities in big skyscrapers that are reliant on cars to get there um, have completely kind of missed. Hmm. Wow. Can you maybe just talk a little bit more yeah. about that? Sorry, Craig. Sure. Um, so on the geometry side or the community side? Uh, um, oh. Probably community, but both. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess maybe quickly on, on the geometry side, what I was sort of looking at is how at different latitudes where the angle of the sun is different and um, understanding how uh, it sort of comes in in the summer to keep the houses warm. Uh, sorry, comes in in the winter to keep the houses warm, but gets blocked in the summer because of these overhanging eaves. That's very typical of traditional Chinese architecture. And they'd kind of um, merge that traditional architecture with a Western thinking um, in these concessions, the French concession, the British concession in China. Um, and, and you had this kind of amazing hybrid effect that still worked for the climate, um, but also meant they could have high density living. Um, but what it meant was that you had these many layers of um, privacy, really. You had your inside your home, but then they had these tiny little streets where people sort of use them as their kitchens. Um, hmm it was the only water supply they had. And so lots of families would then merge together and live in kind of a, a bigger unit. And then you got to a slightly more public street where a little bit of trading would happen. And then you got to an even more public street where there'd be kind of shop fronts and, and the hustle and bustle. Um, and it was all kind of mixed use. It was very easy to kind of get around, very connected, very supportive community, um, you know, where you could sort of, there were many connections basically, one from the other. Um, and just, you know, a, a very high level of content people who were living there wow. because of it, which was a huge contrast from the people who I met when I went and visited some of these satellite towns um, that they built on the outskirts of Shanghai, which were kind of the opposite. Wow. Hey, why was that? And um, so they were sort of skyscrapers that um, people had very little autonomy over, you know, for example, they couldn't even fix their own um, home because, it, you know, it was sort of technology that was kind of beyond them. Um, they had uh, sort of imported technology from the West, like heat mm. pumps and double glazed windows and um, not taken into account the geometry. So they were really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter. And then also the technology didn't work. Um, so it was uncomfortable to live in. Um, but also um, very, you didn't have these sort of human spaces where, you know, you could kind of stand in the street and talk to someone on their um, sort of balcony mm you know, on the first floor and, and all of that kind of connectedness and layers of privacy that those uh, little Lilong houses in Shanghai had. Wow, oh, it's really fascinating. There's so many layers to things when you start to delve into them, isn't there? It's just really fascinating. Have you heard about, um, uh, I think it's, his name's Michael Reynolds. Um, he, he talks about the earth ships. Have, have you I uh, ever read about it? No. Oh, it's, it's, it just reminded me of that because they, it's all about like using the sun to heat, you know, create heating for yourself and um, in a really self, uh, sort of self-sustainable way. And it's quite fascinating. But, you know, you sound like you were quite like you knew in what you really wanted to do and with yourself and your life uh, at this stage already. And you're really young. But where did that love for the environment and, and the, these kind of concepts come from in, in terms of like, um, you know, environmental side of things? Yeah, I think the environment is something I was always, you know, very connected to, I think, growing up. So with the sailing, um, my parents, you know, are very connected to, to the earth. My dad grew up on a farm. We had um, all of our homegrown fruit and veg from our allotment growing up. Um, you know, weekends were spent sort of like pulling carrots down on the allotment. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think there's, there's always been that connection with the natural world and appreciation for it. Um, but it really wasn't until I was 21, I'd finished my degree, um, that I had a chance to then uh, get it out onto the ocean, the, the real big ocean, um, and, and start seeing this plastics issue that then I kind of felt the whole course of my life change um, and, and focus more and more on the environmental side. Hmm. Hmm. 
And and when you, you said now, like on your journey to Shanghai, you kind of discovered a few things and, you know, you, you wrote your dissertation on something a little bit different than what you initially were going to. But was there anything else like when you landed in Shanghai and when you stayed there, did you discover anything new or that you, you know, you didn't know before or um, did it change your perspective on things? Um, I think it was it was mostly that sort of love for the slow travel um, and then the focus of that architecture dissertation. Um, but it was also the first time that I'd really been away from home on my own um, and, and really kind of loved that intrepidness of, um, you know, being out there and kind of cutting that path and getting to, you know, to choose every day when I woke up. Um, what I really wanted to work on and investigate that day. Um, and that's definitely now the thing that I hold, you know, most precious to me is that um, kind of autonomy and freedom um, with what I do now, where every morning I wake up and I'm like, what is the most important thing for me to do today huh. um, to, to make progress on this issue that I care about? Um, and, then, and then start working on that. Uh, that's wow. awesome. And, and so, so what, 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 like, because... Because I think uh, a lot of people, especially that say work for themselves, do struggle with like having a plan of action and, and planning their day and stuff. How do you go about it? You know, you just touched on it there, but is there, you know, how do you do it? Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely something that I've struggled with as well. You know, it's, um, I, I totally understand, you know, working on your own and, and by yourself. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of motivation. Um, so. I have a team as, at the moment, um, which is great. And so the days that I spend working with my team, even if it's just a phone call at the beginning of the day, uh, to kind of start chatting about something that, that I'm a bit stuck on, talking it through, then I just kind of get in the zone. Um, and the rest of the day just sort of vanishes because you're, you know, so focused. And, um, you know, the usual kind of to-do lists um, definitely can help download the brain so that you're not kind of, thinking about the 50 yeah. things you need to do. Once you put them on a list, you're yeah. like, okay, now I can just have a clear focus on this one thing that I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big list writer, um, but it's mostly other people. Um, and if I ever end up just feeling really kind of stuck and you know, not being productive, uh, it's, it's all about talking to people. Um, uh, over the years, I've done hundreds of school talks uh, which I just do for free. And um, that's something that it really kind of gets me excited, sharing awesome. my story and, and think, you know, it, it gets that all kind of going again. And then you get really re-inspired as to why you're doing what you're doing. And it's really easy to kind of jump back into the work. Wow. Cool. Speaking about your productivity, do you do any exercise or anything like that? Um, so having spent eight years on a boat, um, it's been quite a, a sort of unconventional, um, you know, way of living where you're, um, you're either on a boat or on an island or, you know, it's been very transient and um, that routine is something I have absolutely lacked over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of, yes, but it's all a little bit haphazard. It's, um, you know, if I ever get a chance when you get on shore to kind of walk a couple of miles to go to the supermarket instead of getting a taxi, you know, it's always yeah. like, oh great, I get to use my legs today. <laughs> um, you know, and picking that opportunity, obviously going swimming and just kind of, when you're living on a boat, you're just kind of constantly active, um, which is yeah. great. And then nice. when I'm back home, um, you know, sat in front of my laptop, that's when I try and get out, go to the gym, you know, go out for a long walk and uh, yeah, keep, keep active for sure. Yeah, cool. So you make it back to Cambridge and you know, you completed your degree in architecture and you get yourself a job in Australia and uh, you, you decided, you know, why not hitchhike the whole way? I mean, that's just the very normal thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> so it's an amazing story. So tell us all about it. Yeah, absolutely. So I had this job lined up and because of that experience the previous year, I just couldn't bear the thought of getting on a plane to get to Australia. Um, and obviously, with my love for sailing growing up, um, that felt like the natural thing. Um, I wanted to cross the Atlantic. That was the, the kind of first big step. And so I started uh, looking online for opportunities. There's a couple of websites that you can kind of uh, put your profile up as a crew member. 
um, for boats, particularly doing a bunch of races that happen every autumn uh, across the Atlantic. So um, I started looking and then I came across this project called Earth Race. And this wasn't a sailing boat, it's a power boat, but it ran on 100% biodiesel hmm. and had just broken the round the world speed record. Wow. They went around the world in 60 days. Oh, wow. And it just turned out that they were planning another trip uh, from England to Australia and uh, to do a promotional tour to visit 120 cities to talk to schools, politicians and the media about renewable energy. And so it kind of a few things were combining here, my kind of passion for the environment, obviously uh, the exact itinerary that I needed to get me to this job. <laughs> um, and so I wrote to the skipper and said, how do I get a place on your crew? And um, he was getting loads of applicants at the time. And he said, um, we'll just come down to Brighton, which is where they were in the UK and um, come for the weekend and we'll see how you get on. Um, <laughs> So, so that was it. Off I went about two days later to, uh, to Brighton, thinking I was going to be there for the weekend, um, but actually didn't end up coming home for another 923 days. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So, so maybe you can take us through like what those 925 days were like. Was it all on Earth race or how did that pan out? Yeah, so it was supposed to be six months on Earth Race. It ended up being a year, so I stayed mm -hmm. to kind of finish that project. So, um, yeah, it was just that, that first year that was on Earth Race. And then the couple of years after that um, were mostly in the South Pacific, uh, living on little islands and um, hitchhiking on other boats, and then eventually getting to Pangaea, the organization that I set up a few years later. Uh, geez. So... Um... You had like one pair of clothing with you and your toothbrush <laughs> yeah. and like, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, my parents actually came down to wave goodbye when we left the UK and, and brought a bit more stuff down for me. Thank uh. you. Uh, but I still managed to come home three years later wearing the same outfit, apparently. That no way. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. so, so minimalism is something you know, like, you know, all too well, that's for sure. <laughs> So, Absolutely. I think I get a buzz out of it, actually. Yeah, it's a great oh, way to live. So, so what was it? Can you maybe just explain a little bit about Earth Race for you know, those that are listening, like inside and outside? Yeah. So from the outside, it looks like a space rocket. It's silver. Um, it's a really pointy hull, um, you know, almost like a knife-like form because it was a wave piercer. So rather than bouncing over the top of the waves, it was designed to slice through the middle. Wow. Um, and then it had these two stabilizers. So from the front, it looked like a kind of giant bug um, because of these kind of two arches with these stabilizers on it. So, it, I mean, it looked like something from outer space. Um, mm. Particularly when we rocked up in these little Pacific islands that, you know, <laughs> never really saw anyone. They were like, oh, we're being invaded. Oh, <laughs> I told you it was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and... and Oh, sorry. Carry but yeah, then on the inside, it was completely different because from the outside, it looked like this most state of the art vessel you could ever imagine. But because it was de designed to break a record, it was really bare on the inside and it was just exposed kind of carbon fiber um, and this hemp composite that they'd made. They were, they were kind of prototyping um, and it was just kind of bare bones a few bunks, a couple of seats that you drove from, um, and then a microwave and a toaster. Wow. No running wow. water, no toilet, no shower. It was what? like a little capsule. No ways. So, so let's talk a little bit more about like the nuts and bolts. So you'd, you'd like wake up in the morning and we, we'd like, you'd have a big stock of food that you'd taken with you or how would you, would you go fishing or what would you kind yeah. of do for your meals and stuff every day? A bit of both. Um, so yeah, we, we caught a lot of fish. Um, obviously, one of really great sort of way to sustain yourself at sea. It's also packaging free, no plastic. <laughs> um, and uh, and then yeah, we took food as much fresh food really as we could carry, um, and then some tinned food as well for when it ran out. But uh, most of those hops, um, because we were going to all of these cities, that was the focus of the project, and um, we were often in port. Um, and then the longest stint that we actually had on that trip was only 15 days. 
um, and, and just four of us on board. Um, compared to what I do now with 14 people on board for about 60 days. <laughs> um, wow. You know, it was, it was, yeah, kind of easy to provision. So you, the, the cutting through the waves, that must be quite amazing. Do you have like outlooks, like you can see what's going on? Because like, because I mean, the waves get massive, I can only imagine. And instead of going up, there's like 60 foot thing, you, you literally go through it. So you kind of just go through the top. How does that work? Yeah, so it, so there's a windscreen basically. Um, you know, it feels like you're in a bit of like a racing car, and um, that windscreen was designed to have seven meters or twenty odd foot of water above it. Whoa! Uh, what? So that, that's kind of as deep as it could go. Um, but wow. you, you didn't normally go that deep. You were just sort of skimming through. Um, and then at the the back, it had these kind of um, horns, um, which were actually the, sort of the snorkels. For the engine bay um, and so they were curved in a way that as the boat was moving um, very quickly forwards it created um, a vacuum wow. behind and allowed that ventilation of the engine bay when you were underwater wow that's incredible mm. and the biofuel uh, where what sort of how were you creating that or where did you get it yeah, so we got most of it from um, Spain and Portugal uh, which was all waste cooking oils Mm -hmm. uh, that was coming out of Europe. And then we picked up a little bit more in Fiji that was coconut oil. Um, obviously, there's uh, lots of coconuts in those <laughs> Pacific islands. Um, and then when we got to Australia, um, it was waste animal fats from the meatworks, which Goodness. didn't smell so good. <laughs> oh. um, but everything we were using was waste products because um, this is one of the sort of controversial issues around biofuel um, is that what you don't want to be doing is kind of taking down rainforests or replacing food agriculture to grow fuel because uh, mm. then suddenly it's you know very unsustainable um, but using waste products that we already use and kind of throw away is, is one of the best places we can get biofuel from so interesting mm. I've, I've got a friend of mine he's like really into his cars and motorbikes and stuff like that and he he used to tell me or he does i know he still does this he would fill his petrol tank up half with petrol and then the rest of it with uh, vegetable oil. And I'm like, are you flipping crazy? He's like, he's like, no, it's like, it's the best thing to use. And I'm like, no ways. And now just listening to you, I'm like, oh, he, he makes total sense now. <laughs> he's onto something. And yeah. he's like, it's cheaper than petrol as well. So he just buys, <laughs> that's what he does. So, it's <laughs> uh, so, so were you, uh, so you would shower, you wouldn't shower. You would just like have a, a dip in the ocean and, yeah, we stopped yeah. about nine o'clock every morning. Um, so there were four of us on board and we were rotating um, who was driving the boat. Um, mm. So we all did two, three hour shifts each day um, on the helm where we were driving. So nine o'clock in the morning was kind of the turn of one of the shifts and we'd stop the boat and we'd all go for a swim um, mm. off the back. And yeah, kind of get the coconut soap out. That's the one that does um, froth up in salt water. Normal soap oh, doesn't. Yeah. Um, wow. Quickly learn that one. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, go for a little swim. And, and it was those moments when I first started noticing the plastic. <laughs> wow. When we were in the middle of this open ocean, having our Goodness kind of daily gosh. wash. Um, and there it all was. Wow. So, so uh, I'm imagining this might have something to do with the question, but at, at what point did you sort of decide that architecture and the job in Australia um, was not really the path for you anymore? It took a really long time. So it took um, first six months to get to Australia. And then I went to visit the architecture firm that I was supposed to work for and asked if I could delay the job six months and finish the project on Earthrace. And then even at the end of those six months, when I decided to go and live in Tonga for a while, where I'd seen so much of this plastic, still then I was thinking, I'm going to go and do the architecture job. And it probably took really about three years of kind of gap years <laughs> when I kept thinking this was just a few years out and then I was going to go back and be an architect. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until those three years had passed that I thought actually you know, I've, I've sort of accidentally fallen into another career here, something that I can actually see myself doing for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, the Tongan Island. 
that you stopped off at and that you went back to. So can you tell us a little bit more about the island and, and your experience there, maybe a bit about the people, their traditions and, and things that you discovered? Yeah, so this is a little island that we had passed through and I'd seen this plastics issue. Um, both the plastic that was kind of washing up um, on their shoreline, often from countries thousands of miles away, and then also a, a really bad domestic issue um, of plastic. So Tonga, like all of these other little islands and low-lying places around the world, uh, they are, um, at the moment, the sea level rise is causing their soil to become so salty that they can't even grow the crops in the ground anymore that they used wow. to rely on. And then they're also being overfished, um, either illegally or their government sold the fishing rights. Um, and so, you know, the, the oceans that they used to rely on for their protein, they now can only catch, you know, these tiny little juvenile fish. Hmm. So there's this huge impact on their food supply, which they then obviously have to replace. And it comes in the form of goods imported from overseas um, and they all come wrapped in plastic because mm. they have to be transported for thousands of miles. Um, so there's all of this waste, there's nowhere for it to go, there's no landfill, there's no safe incineration, um, it just gets dumped on the beach, chucked in the ocean or burnt. Mm. Um, and it was actually that burning smell that kept getting me. Every island that we landed on all I could smell that filled the air was that really distinctive toxic smell of plastic burning. Um, and so I started to find out, you know, what is that smell? And then I started to learn about these chemicals um, that are made from incomplete combustion. So when you burn something in a kind of back garden setting um, and it doesn't have enough extra heat and oxygen to fully burn it like it would in a proper incinerator, um, then it produces these chemicals that uh, are carcinogens. Mm. Um, and they're endocrine disruptors and they mimic hormones and uh, they're really chemicals that we don't want in us. And um, the way it was happening in Tonga in particular um, is that, you know, all of the kids would just be kind of playing around the fire Goodness. in the back garden where this was happening. Mm. Um, so that, that was really, you know, the thing that I wanted to stop. At first it was all about the burning because um, I could just tell how bad it was. Um, for, for health I mean it made me gag <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know and then when I found out you know what it was actually doing um, that that became kind of the mission sure wow yeah the the human body knows if something's like just not good for it and you know you obviously just totally viscerally felt that and uh, I, I guess off the back of that you um, organized a sort of a cleanup event um, for the island uh, too what what did you do for that and, and uh, what was the, the result? Yeah, so um, as I started to, to spend some time there and getting to know the locals um, and trying to learn the Tongan language, it's quite tricky, um, but, <laughs> but I quickly discovered that there wasn't actually a word for rubbish or for <laughs> bin and that that concept of throwing something away into a system didn't exist in the culture because... I mean, up until recently, it hadn't needed to. You've got banana peels and coconut husks, you know, that can just be thrown on the ground, no problem. But of course, this new introduction of plastic, um, there was nowhere for it to go. Um, but what that made me realize is that it wasn't only infrastructure that this community needed, but actually a new way of thinking about mm. this completely new inorganic material. Um, so at that point, I started working with the schools. Uh, there were 11 schools on these two islands that were connected by a causeway. And so every day I'd head off to another school and talk to a bunch of students about plastic and the ocean um, and pretty simple stuff, really. You know, the difference between a piece of plastic and a coconut husk, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, seems really, really basic. But um, the first mini cleanup that I did with a bunch of kids there, uh, they all went off to pick up the plastic and they came back with the palm fronds and the coconut wow. husks as well because you know, there was no real distinction. Wow. Um, so a lot of it came down to kind of a shift in mindset and, and understanding the problem. Um, and so that went on for six months, uh, living with a local family, uh, which was an amazing experience. I mean, it was a bit of a necessity because by this point I was 
over a year out of university, um, hadn't really earned any money. <laughs> I'd, I'd had somewhere to sleep and I'd had everything I needed to eat um, on Earth Race, but it was, you know, very much kind of volunteer role. And then I was up in Tonga. So getting taken in by a local family was sort of the only option um, for me to stay there. Uh, but that's also what made the experience so rich and made me much more effective at what I was doing as well. Um, there were lots of daughters in the family all around the same age as me. So uh, we all kind of got on well, despite the drastically different um, backgrounds and life experiences up until wow. that point. Um, but it was, it was a really transformative time for me, those six months in Tonga. Um, what a great experience. Wow. Yeah, it was sort of, I mean, oof, makes me kind of shiver thinking about it. Um, it. You know, there were really tough times too. We um, had a tsunami while I was there, which was probably the most terrifying day of my whole life. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then a few weeks before that, a, a, one of the only ships that comes and services the island to bring in supplies um, sank uh, just off the island and wow. hundreds of local people died. And it was... It was pretty heavy, actually, um, but it was it definitely, you know, kind of made me realize how vulnerable these parts of the world are for so many different reasons um, and the challenges that they're facing. And um, it sort of put it all into perspective. Sure. We. Um, Is so it possible you, to, to yeah. talk? Sorry, guys, to, to yeah. just briefly tell us about the tsunami? I mean, it's something that. I mean, not many people have experienced or been near, but it's something you do hear fairly often. Sure, yeah. So um, it was in you know, 2009, it was a tsunami that hit the South Pacific. Um, and we were basically woken by um, a, a warning saying that the tsunami was on its way. And, um, you know, my family who I was living with basically turned to me and they were sort of like, well, what's the tsunami? You know, mm -hmm. And I was just thinking... You know, having, um, you know, seen the images from previous years of, of tsunamis hitting these low-lying islands. So we, we jumped in the family truck and, and drove down to the beach and found that the water had gone. Um, oh. It's like someone had pulled the plug out of the ocean. And the most eerie scene, you know, all of the boats were on the bottom, the fish, Goodness. you know, kind of on the seabed, and all the kids have run out to pick up the fish. Oh. Um, so we managed to get everyone uh, kind of off, off the seabed and, and over to the other side of the island. But I'm talking about an island that is half a mile wide. Huh. Um, so, but, but there was water on the other side, so it seemed like the sensible place to go. Um, and we basically just waited. Um, and we'd been given a time by this um, like emergency beacon that you know, it was when the tsunami was going to hit us. And we waited and waited and waited. And finally, that time came and went. Um, and we went back down to the water uh, about an hour or so later and found that um, all of the boats were then smashed up um, mm. into the village or washed away. Um, and, you know, the whole sort of about a third of the village had, had gone in terms of homes. Um, but what was amazing is that um, no lives were lost on the island wow. that I was on. You know, we'd had this message, we'd got everybody in and we were all on the other side of the island. Um, whereas mm -hmm. one island north of us, um, there were 11 fatalities because they mm -hmm. just had no, you know, there was sort of no um, plan as to, to, to sort of get away from it. Oh, Goodness. that's hectic. And was that because you remember from like previous ones that you know the when the water goes you actually need to get out the way like or did, did they actually have an idea as well yeah I mean definitely the kids had no idea but mm. yeah there was enough you know it, the island that I was on was you know more kind of connected it had the governor of the island group on it and and you know they they were able to kind of usher everybody over the other side it was the even more remote places than that um that, that kind of got stuck wow okay hmm. So, so sorry, just to go back a little bit to that, to that cleanup that you did, it was, it was quite a phenomenal cleanup though, you know, wasn't it? The amount of stuff that you found, I think the numbers are, are worth mentioning. Yes. Um, so yeah, after that six months um, had passed, we had this big cleanup and um, I mean, what was amazing was the number of people that came out that day. We had 3000 local people, which was three quarters of the entire population. And came and picked up rubbish <laughs> and together we picked up 56 tons in just five hours 
Um, which I didn't even think was possible. What does 56 tons equate to for like, you know? Yeah, so it fills eight shipping containers. Eight? Yeah. Yes, no worries. Wow. And that was once we'd kind of cleaned, sorted and compacted it um, into wow. 3,000 rubber sacks. Is that mostly plastic or was that glass or, or just everything? Yeah, I mean, we picked up everything. Um, yeah, definitely mostly plastic. But we also picked up, um, there was a lot of metal on the island. Um, so it's so expensive to import something to a little island, uh, like a car, uh, mm. that when it does then die, um, you're not going to pay to export it off. Um, so there were a lot of you know, things around the island as well that kind of end up, the beach just is the place where everything gets dumped. You know, it's traditionally kind of the toilet for a lot of mm. coastal communities. Mm. Um, and then it becomes the dumping ground. Um, I mean, in the Maldives, um, the word for dump is the same as the word for beach. Wow. It's, you know, it's, um, it, that's very much how they, they kind of think about the, the coastline. Um, so yeah, that we just found yeah, bits of metal everywhere as well, um, and glass and clothing. Textiles was one of the, the hardest things because also it's so kind of soiled, um, you know, and, and dirty and disgusting. You can't even do anything with it afterwards. Hmm. Um, and, and nappies became hmm. my biggest pet hate. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Um, which were everywhere. And obviously, you know, it's very hard to do anything with that. Wow. Goodness. Yeah, crazy. Mm. So, and, and then in um, 2014, I'm not sure, when, when was the Tongan thing? What year was that, sorry? 2009. Okay, cool. So there's a bit of a gap here, I guess. Um, I know that uh, in 2014, uh, after you'd been, you know, involved with the plastics for a while, mm. you decided to get your blood tested and there's a list, I'm not sure exactly what list it is, but of like 35 uh, banned substances, which I don't know, humans shouldn't consume or something, but you had 29 of those in your blood sample. So can you maybe just tell us a little bit about that and how that's probably changed your outlook on certain things? Absolutely. And, and kind of why that came about was, and to fill in that gap between 2009 and 2014, that's when I was running Pangea Exploration. Uh, so that was this organization where we, we got this 72 foot sailing boat, we turned it into an expedition vessel and I started sailing the high seas, really studying these giants, these accumulation zones where all the plastic eventually ends up um, once it leaves land and, and kind of makes its way into the ocean. Um, and it was through the research we were doing out there um, that I started realizing that the plastic was getting into the fish. Mm. And that's what got me kind of asking more questions you know we were bringing up these fish we we're opening up their stomachs and we were finding pieces of plastic in and it just made me think you know these fish are in the same food chain that we're in you know is there a chance that uh, this is also affecting you know our health as well and um, so that's what probed me to doing this test um, so these 35 chemicals were a mix of things some are used in the production of plastics things like phthalates um, and then others are um, just other nasty chemicals that also end up in the ocean and we find in our water samples. Mm. So things like pesticides um, and then mm. flame retardants. Wow. Um, so chemicals that are really useful. You know, we have them on our clothing, our interiors, inside our cars to stop them combusting. Um, but, you know, when they actually then, as a pollutant in the environment, they're... Um, they're not good for, you know, to get inside us. They lead to cancer and they disrupt our hormones. Mm. And so this whole kind of cocktail, basically, of chemicals. Um, and we, yeah, we, so we looked for those in my body. And as you said, we, we found 29 of those 35. And it had a real impact on me. I mean, so I grew up, you know, eating from an allotment. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and I've been, you know, out, out sort of around the world thinking I was um, healthy and conscious of my mm. diet and, um, you know, and conscious of my health. And to suddenly realize that, you know, I have these chemicals inside me that I kind of can't control. Um, and it, you know, it really changed my perspective. Um, I think also because often when I talk to people about environmental issues, um, it's usually something that we are reading in the news or we're hearing on a podcast or it's something that seems far away. 
and it's happening to somebody else and it might affect them in the future, but it's, you know, it, it's not going to affect me. And, um, and then you realize that actually, I mean, I'm afraid all of us, we have mm. uh, what we call a body burden, you know, this chemical footprint, something we'll never get rid of. Um, and at the moment, the levels aren't alarmingly high that we need to be immediately concerned about our health. Um, but I find the fact that it's happening uh, such a scary indicator mm, of the direction that we're heading. And but our endocrine feel- system is so yeah. sensitive, isn't it? Sorry, buddy. Carry on. No, but I, I feel like, you know, so, so this is just like one element of things, you know, like you know, there, there's so many other things that we are not conscious of. So when you put, you know, this is one layer, then people are not eating healthy. Then there's pesticides in our food and the soil. And you know what I mean? Like it's, even though you say it's not, not a big thing in its, uh, by itself, but when you add everything else on, you know, we are actually becoming super unhealthy and that's why there's high rates of cancer and everything else going on. So, so it is, it is super concerning that that's something that we might not even think about, but it's actually happening as well. Absolutely. No, and I totally agree. You know, there's, there's so many unanswered questions and um, one of the frustrating things is the lack of evidence. Um, you know, mm. as you say, like cancer le- levels are increasing, miscarriages are increasing, but you know, you can't actually say it's because of, you know, X, Y, Z inside me. Um, because there's so little understanding um, about how these chemicals are affecting us and how um, the combination of different chemicals may affect one person mm. with one set of genes versus another person. Yeah. Um, and unless you put a human being in a controlled experiment for 40 years, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and dictate everything that they breathe mm-hmm. and eat and, you know, the pillow that they sleep on and everything else, um, you're never going to know. Uh, is, there, is there some kind of sort of broad blanket advice when d- talking about consuming these kinds of things like or, or absorbing, I don't know what the right word of both probably um, these kind of chemicals or is it kind of like do the obvious things and hope for the best or is there certain things that we should all be doing maybe? Yeah, or it's, not it's, doing? <laughs> it is a good question. I mean, a lot of it is the sort of common sense that we already mm. know, um, you know, eating, um, as little processed food as possible. You know, that's a place that that a lot of these chemicals kind of come in. So trying to eat close to the source, um, you know, if you can eat lower in the food chain as well, um, these are all chemicals that biomagnify up the food chain. Um, So eating a plant-based diet um, and eating organic, um, you know, you still can't avoid it, but you're going to be doing a lot better. Um, And yeah and just kind of being conscious about the environment around you looking at products that you're using you know Mm. beauty products wash you know uh, cleansing products and all of those looking for things that don't have chemicals in them there's a couple of apps um that kind of help you um one of them is called think dirty Mm -hmm. you can scan the barcode and it tells you what sort of chemicals are in it um and yeah there's sort of tools basically online that you can use That's awesome. Scout it out. So you've just finished your 11th voyage around the world uh, with Pangea, is that right? Uh, This is with X Expedition. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. And this was a sort of a special one. Is that, is that correct? Um, so yeah, we've just finished our 11th voyage, not that went around the world, but that was somewhere around the world. That's <laughs> yeah. what you meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to make that clear, it hasn't been 11 <laughs> laps. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, um, in 2014, we started this project X Expedition. And it was off the back of this blood test, because when I then started finding out, you know, what impact do these 29 chemicals have on my body. Um, I learned more about endocrine disruptors and the fact they mimic hormones and mess with the chemical messages inside our bodies. And actually for us girls, these chemicals during pregnancy um, are really bad news. And that we can actually pass them on to our children Mm. when we give birth and when we breastfeed. And so what I realized is it was actually quite a women-centered issue. And so I thought, why not tackle this with an amazing team of women and set up 
um, a voyage across the North Atlantic Ocean to go to one of these gyres, these accumulation zones of which there are five around the planet, uh, to study both the plastics, but also try and answer some of these unanswered questions around toxic pollution. Um, and so that's what we did. We brought together this amazing team from all over the world. We had 10 nationalities ranging from scientists, to filmmakers, journalists, artists, packaging designers, policy makers, teachers, and wow. um, you know, people that covered all of these disciplines to come together and, and um, you know, kind of work it out together about what, what we could do. Um, and so that was back then in 2014, and it was supposed to be this one-off voyage. Uh, but as you say, we've just got back from our 11th, wow. <laughs> only four years later, uh, mm. because the project just took off. Um, it, it got a lot of traction, uh, both from the team on board and the media who were, um, you know, uh, covering it. And um, the United Nations then sort of invited us to present our work in Geneva, and, and it just got a lot more recognition. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's been a huge success. That's amazing. That's amazing. Can, can we maybe just like stay here for a little bit, just talk about a bit of the dynamics and stuff on the boats. I can imagine, I can imagine when you've got like 10 people that are all probably pretty strong minded, um, that, that it must be, it must take a lot, um, of leadership, I guess, and understanding of each other to, to make a success of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the great thing about when you're on a boat, um, so you're sailing the boat for 24 hours a day and you have a, a real sort of structure on the boat. You've got a watch system. The whole team's divided into three groups and at any one time, one of those groups is responsible for sailing the boat, being on watch and doing chores on the boat, cooking dinner, cleaning, everything else. And I think that really helps the dynamic because mm. it, you know, everyone's busy, everyone's got something to do and everyone knows what they should be doing and when they should be doing it. And so it removes a lot of that sort of like, you know, team dynamic that you see in something like The Apprentice where everyone's like, wow, ah, what should we do? Where should we go? <laughs> 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 yeah. and it's very much like, this is how it is. And everyone gets into a routine and they like it, you know, it just works. And, and then we have those moments where we have um, an, an onboard lecture series every evening. We have a different woman sharing her story or her expertise, mm. teaching the rest of the group. Um, in the afternoon, we do science. Um, so again, it's kind of very structured. We're collecting samples. Um, and then we're doing workshops. We're kind of mapping out the spectrum of solutions. We're working out what role we can all play um, back on land, which is where we're really going to solve this problem. Um, and to be honest, it's so full, <laughs> um, wow. you know, it's, um, and it's such a kind of positive atmosphere. And that's actually the main reason that I've carried on doing it. And what I totally wasn't expecting from this first voyage is how different the vibe was going to be on the boat with an all women crew. And wow. I just, I just, it totally, you know, didn't see it coming. Um, but the, the bonding that kind of takes place um, with an all women crew is, is completely different to a mixed crew. Mm -hmm. um, and for some reason on all of our voyages, we seem to start with a bit of in induction of horrendous weather. <laughs> and so <laughs> We, we tend to kind of go out into like a headwind <laughs> with huge waves and about 40 knots of wind um, and everyone is seasick. <laughs> but it does something where it kind of breaks down all of these barriers yeah. <laughs> and, and then you've just got this perfect platform to kind of build these relationships on top of it. Um, There's some kind of bonding that happens when you're vomiting next to your mate and you're exactly. both in it together. Yeah, holding each other's hair back and yeah. holding each other's off the deck. Yeah, uh, exactly. And yeah, there's something at the end of it, you know, where you have that feeling that sort of everyone would go to the end of the earth for, for their friends on board. Wow. And that bond is then so important with what everyone goes on to do afterwards. Um, and for me, these voyages began as scientific research. They began as like wanting to find out what's going on and the communication side, kind of reporting what was happening. Um, but they turned into an opportunity to build an army, an mm. army of amazingly powerful change makers who've had that firsthand experience of seeing the issue fully understood it, but most importantly, then have a community that can support them in becoming a change maker on the issue when they leave the boat. 
And that was the feeling I got when we got to Martinique at the end of this first voyage. So we sailed a month across the North Atlantic and got to the end. And it was a really tough trip. Um, and it was the first time I had skippered a full crew across an ocean. Huh. Um, so for me, it was a really big deal. And um, I remember getting to the end and thinking, oh, this should feel like, you know, we've done it. We've got all of our scientific samples. We made our documentary. You know, this has taken a year of planning. I remember getting off the boat and thinking, this feels like day one. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like the beginning because of the amount of energy, you know, that, that kind of left wow. the boat for all of the crew. It was day one. Um, That's amazing. And yeah, setting them up for everything they were going to go on and do. Wow. I can imagine you just must learn so much. Like you said, it's, it, you, you sort of have one idea in your mind and then just this whole new world kind of opens up and uh, the lessons learned must be quite phenomenal. Mm, absolutely. Um, there's both what you're seeing in terms of the plastics, but you're also experiencing this amazing magic of our natural world and the thing that I fell in love with I think you know far before I realized um when I was a little girl you know the magic of the ocean and you know when mm -hmm. you're sailing into the sunset every night and you've got dolphins at the bow and you're in this tranquil incredible space where you're cut off from society you've got no Facebook and no emails and you know it's Beautiful. just it's an amazing headspace out there yeah, and what is what is uh, skipper pen like uh, when you're in the in the zone of being the skipper? <laughs> oh, you might have to ask the crew. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I, I'm just pretty focused um, on the mission, but also on keeping everybody happy, um, yeah. because I know that if you have a team that works really well together, then everything you know kind of it, it all works. For um, sure. Yeah. So making sure everybody's getting out of it, what they really are there to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so just focusing a little bit, so I guess on the issue at hand, yeah, like let's talk a little bit about plastics maybe and, and microplastics in particular, like, can you tell us a little bit about those and, and how they're formed? Yeah. So um, most of the plastic that ends up in the ocean is coming from land. It's coming from streams and rivers and drains, um, about 80% of it. And then the other 20% um, obviously eventually comes from land as well, but it's coming from sort of the shipping and fishing community. So people who are already out there. Um, so the plastic goes in and then the waves and the wind and the sun break the plastic down into these small fragments. I um, actually got a little sample right mm. here. Um, uh -huh. So this is a sample of microplastics um, that we've taken from the middle of the North Pacific. And oh. um, most of them are smaller than my little fingernail. Wow. Um, so a microplastic is technically anything smaller than five millimeters. <laughs> and this is what we're finding is covering the surface of our ocean. Um, and you can't actually see it really when you look at the water. The water mm -hmm. looks blue and clean and you'll see the wow. odd bigger piece floating in between um, either something you can recognize like a bottle or a cigarette lighter or a bottle top um, but it's only then when you take this fine net through the water that you realize there's actually hundreds of these microplastics in between that are forming this soup on the surface of our ocean Jeez. and and why is that so bad like i know it seems obvious but like the small pieces i mean obviously the micro part of the microplastics is quite a significant aspect to this yeah, exactly. So um, when they're that small, they're then the same size as zooplankton uh, that's floating on the surface as well. And so hence we're then catching fish and finding they're ingesting this plastic um, because it's all the same size. It all looks quite similar. Um, but also the fact that the plastic is so small is also what makes it so hard to clean up. Mm. If it was big pieces, we could kind of go out and um, and lift them all into a boat and sort it out. But the fact that it's tiny and it's the same size as the marine life, there's really no way to extract it once it's Jesus. that size. Yeah. Um, and what we're now learning more about is the fact that as it gets smaller and it gets coated in algae, it then becomes negatively buoyant and it starts to sink in those really deep parts of the ocean. 
Um, mm -hmm. And at that stage, we just don't know what's going on um, mm -hmm. beyond that, you know, and the impact that that plastic is going to be having on the seabed at those depths. Um, so there's a lot more research to be done there. Goodness. We, we do so much to, to Mother Earth. It's crazy. You just don't even realize the half of it, hey? So exactly. you're getting a lot of data that you're getting from satellite trackers that you're adding to these areas with, with all the, the plastics and rubbish in the ocean. Um, and what kind of data are you collecting? And also, what is it like working with NASA? Yeah, so um, the, the data that we're getting is really wide ranging. Um, we're, so from these samples uh, that we're collecting on the surface, we're then looking at the um, amount of plastic, the weight of the plastic, um, and also the type of plastic. So we can work out what type of polymer it is. And then that helps us determine where it might have come from. Hmm. So is it from the fishing industry? Is it a piece of um, polyester fiber that might have come from a washing machine drain um, from the clothing that we put in the washing machine? Um, or is it a piece of kind of PET that's probably come from a plastic bottle? Uh, so that's a lot of the data is then going to inform eventually solutions because it's looking at um, the, the types of materials that are there. Um, we're also looking at the chemicals that are on the surface of the plastic, the chemicals in the water. And we're even sampling the air to hmm. look at the, the microfibers and things that we might be breathing in. Uh, so it's quite wide ranging. Um, and then the work that we did with NASA, that was um, to deploy a tracker uh, onto a piece of debris. Um, so we looked for a, a large piece of debris that will be in the ocean for a while. Um, and attach the satellite tracker to it. Um, I mean, it was it's sort of like you know, the size of a car, um, this piece of debris. And then when I actually got in the water, it was like an iceberg. It was like 10 times bigger underneath. Wow. Um, of, of nets, but also uh, lots of other containers and bits of plastic and kind of household waste tangled up within it because those nets act as a bit of an aggregate. Um, and so that debris will now be tracked uh, to see the movements um, and learn more about how things are moving around in these gyres, but also so it can get cleaned up by a bigger boat because uh, it was far too big for us to be able to bring on our sailboat. Um, oh, yeah. And what will also be interesting about that is to then look at what other species are on it because this debris attracts um, kind of the algae and then the little fish and the slightly bigger fish and eventually whole ecosystems uh, sort of acts a bit like a coral reef wow. but but it's moving um, mm -hmm. and this is one of the worrying things is that it starts to transport species from one side of an ocean to another mm. species that never normally would have, would survive mid-ocean but when they can sort of be attached to this moving coral reef and the piece of debris then they can survive um, so we're learning a lot more about that as well. I can imagine. And, and, mm -hmm. and just the, these things are called gyres, is that right? Yeah. And Craig, I can't believe you copped out on that word, bud. Like we were just, I saw him, he, he was like reading this question. <laughs> he's and, big plastic he's thing. Big plastic <laughs> things. I was like, you just copped out there, but that was. Oh, <laughs> no, I didn't know if you noticed that. Or I thought it was uh, no, I knew, but I was like, yeah, <laughs> you out straight away. But I thought so I'd Good get him. Guys, there we go. No, I won't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just, um, you, you we see like these these videos on Facebook and stuff, and some of these like islands, or they call them plastic islands and stuff. Is that true? Like, are they as massive as you you might see on Facebook? Like, like literally, you know, kilometers long. Do, have you ever experienced that, or is that kind of bit yeah? Of so uh, yeah, out in the middle of the ocean, um, there aren't these islands. So we get um, debris walls and we get windrows where the currents and the wind kind of pushes bits of plastic together um, into rafts. Uh, also in the Sargasso Sea in the North Atlantic where there's lots of sargassum weed that acts, acts as an aggregate um, and kind of bundles a lot of plastic up in it together. So it looks like a vaguely solid area. Um, but they're absolutely not islands. You couldn't walk on them, you know, and they are, they are relatively small um, in comparison to um, how big these gyres are, which mm. are a thousand miles wide um, with these, the soup of microplastics. And mm. um, the pictures that you often see of lots of plastic in the water are usually coastal. 
Mm. Um, and so they are, for example, like in Indonesia, you know, we're just going into monsoon season right now and lots of pictures are coming out of um, bays that uh, the rain comes down and it washes all of the plastic into a bay. Mm. Um, and it does look like a kind of solid layer of plastic mm. over that, that bit of water. Um, we've seen recent images from the Dominican Republic showing the same thing. Um, where you know a current has changed and pushed a lot of domestic waste that's been coming out of a river into a bay um, mm. so that's when you see those kind of big solid areas um, but uh, but yeah that's not what we see in the ocean uh, just because the oceans are, are so vast and by that time it's broken into uh, quite a lot of fragments wow so, so you said that these gyres are thousands of miles long yes yeah. it's, it's quite tragic isn't it yeah, so this summer we sailed from Hawaii to Vancouver. It took three weeks. Uh, the first week um, we had really rough weather uh, as we sort of got through the trade winds. And then the middle week we were in the calmer weather of the Jaya. And it was for those seven days we were watching a stream of plastic passing the boat. Um, Good Lord. A piece every 10 seconds that you could see with your eyes from the boat and not to mention then the the samples of microplastics that we were pulling up every few hours. Um, mm. And then, so that went on for seven days. And that time we sailed a thousand miles towards Vancouver. Good Lord. Jeepers. That's crazy. Mm. So something like only 9% of plastic uh, that we use is recycled. And I want to try and say a quick number here. I was watching a, a video <laughs> earlier on and then the, the, the number of plastic bags used from January and this was to October and it was like three trillion eight hundred and eighty four billion nine hundred and ninety million nine hundred and ninety eight thousand five hundred and forty three and counting like every second like just a ridiculous amount it, that's actually very very scary and that's just plastic bags um, how do we make people more aware of the environmental issues that this is causing yeah no it's a good question and it's one of the things that I really struggle with especially trying to communicate you know, what I've seen out there because um, everybody's looking for that sensational image. You know, even when we were talking to the media by satellite phone from the boat, uh, they were like, so have you found a picture of a turtle tangled in a fishing net yet? Oh. And then they're like, okay, well, we're not going to publish. And you're like, you're missing the point here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the five trillion fragments that you can't even see that are the problem. Um, yeah. And this is one of the things I find so hard to communicate, um, other than saying that. Um, but, you know, you can't communicate it visually because, um, you know, no photo or video clip is going to really explain that. And it's, you know, it's not going to explain the um, seven days of kind of grueling sailing that it's taken to get to that point that also mm. makes you realize how inconvenient it is <laughs> that this plastic is there and how hard and hostile that environment is um, to even think about cleaning it up. And um, so that's the kind of message at the moment that we're really talking about is um, so many people are aware that there's a problem of plastic. You know, we've seen banning straws or something that's just kind of gone wild in the UK at the moment. Um, but really understanding the issue um, and understanding why working at the source to solve it rather than cleaning it up is so important. Um, it, it does really take kind of going there to see it. Um, so, so, so maybe you could spell it out a little bit. Um, I know it seems silly now to you to almost ask, but why is it so bad that there's so much plastic in the ocean? Like other than it not looking nice, you know, what is the actual like ramification to us? So um, it's a great question when you put it like that. One of the honest truth is that we don't know enough about the impacts. Um, what we do know is that it's affecting seabirds and marine mammals. Around 100,000 every year um, are dying from ingesting or getting strangled by plastic. And um, when it comes to actually human health, uh, that's where the science is just, as we touched on earlier with the chemicals, mm. Um, there's just really not enough evidence to be able to draw those full connections yet. But there's a lot of evidence pointing that, you know, it's generally not, not good news that there's all this pollution in the ocean environment, which is so fundamental to the health of the planet. Mm. Um, and, and I think also what we don't really learn in school or is common knowledge growing up is 
It's just how key the health of the ocean is. Uh, the fact that you know we rely on it for the basis of our food chains, um, our water supply, and um, amazingly, the oxygen and the air that we breathe, mm. over half of it comes from the phytoplankton that live on the surface mm. of the ocean. Uh, now, I certainly grew up thinking that oxygen came from trees. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then I realized that more than half of it comes from the sea. Mm. And, mm. and you just kind of, it puts it into perspective. Um, so, so that's why we need a healthy ocean. And obviously the pollution that's going into it right now is just taking it in the other direction. But the real impact that um, this plastic kind of sinking to the seabed and, and getting into the food chain is actually going to have on us, I really can't tell you. Um, because yeah. the ocean is so vast and still so undiscovered. Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's, it's actually very frustrating that because you just know it's not good and people just want to show me the, you know, the X, Y, and Z. And, and like you said, and it's, it's actually super frustrating, I can imagine, for you because even that question is like, you know, it's ridiculous. You don't have to almost ask, you know what I mean? But yeah, it, I can understand the frustration. So what, what can we each do to decrease our plastic usage? So it all starts with individual actions. And that's one thing I realized when we're out there, when you're looking at a toothbrush in the middle of the ocean, you think this toothbrush, it once belonged to somebody. Someone used to use it to clean their teeth every evening, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and how is it now a thousand miles away kind of in my hand at sea? And so, um, you know, it's, it's billions of micro actions that have created the problem. Um, but the empowering thing is that it, it's micro actions that are also going to solve it. Um, mm. So it's, it's mostly thinking about our daily consumption of plastic and particularly single use plastic. Um, it, it can get a bit kind of paralyzing when you just start thinking plastic and you're like, oh, the laptop that I'm using to talk to you right yeah. now is full <laughs> of plastic. And, yeah. um, you, you know, there's our, our cars, our planes, everything is, um, it wouldn't work without it. Um, but it's all about single use because that's the stuff that's used once, thrown away, and makes up the majority of the pollution in the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. So water bottles, plastic bags, uh, coffee cups, the lids, straws, um, disposable cutlery, all of those things that usually are in our life for a few hours, um, and then they're gone. That's the stuff that we can easily do without. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember like I used to um, work in the city in London and I was just like shocked like every single day because uh, I always made my lunch and stuff for work. But most people go and buy their stuff, but every single day it would be, you know, more packaging, uh, more knives and forks and plastic knives and forks. And they would just be thrown straight away. Like I would have my metal one and knives and forks spoon as well and just use that every single day and wash it. Like I was like, how, why are the people not doing this? Like it's, it, it, first of all, it's nicer to eat with a metal fork yeah. and knife. And um, it's the most easiest thing to do. The only thing you have to do is like take an extra minute to wash that when you're washing your hands. So I think it's things like that, that, that people just, they're oblivious to sometimes. And it's, I don't know if it's an ignorance thing or a not caring thing, but it's, it's something that we definitely need to change, I, I feel. And like you said, it's the micro things and those micro things all add up, especially when you have 7 billion humans all doing these things. It's, it's super important that we each take responsibility for our actions mm. and, and, and understand that we are impacting it and we can impact it in a positive or a negative way. So can I ask a question yeah. before you move on there, Gareth? Um, if, say for example, I do have the plastic knife and fork, right? But then I think, well, I've taken the plastic knife and fork, but I'm going to throw it into the recycling bin. Does that negate me, you know, the, the bad that I've done? Do I, can I feel okay with myself or not? So the challenge of recycling, there's a little bit of a myth around recycling. It's a, a thing that makes us all feel better because we sort of, mm. well, it's okay, we're recycling it. But um, as we sort of talked about earlier, only 9% of the plastic that we're using at the moment is getting recycled. And that number's so low because all these different types of plastic, um, they all have different chemical structures to give them the different properties that they have. And when we recycle something, we can only take one type of plastic at a time to turn it into a good quality product at the other end. So 
something like a PET bottle, which is your typical water bottle or um, soft drink, that's got a high recycling rate um, because it's quite a pure type of plastic. But as soon as um, a marketing manager decides that they want to put a yellow dye into the plastic bottle to make it more stand out on the shelf, um, then suddenly that means it's not recyclable. Mm. And, and so this is the big challenge is at the moment we don't have any standardization around the plastic products that are made. And so trying to recycle them is very hard. Um, and then also trying to actually sort them in the first place. Um, just last week, I was at a sorting centre here in London. And it's amazing. There's an entire factory in central London. I mean, multiple of them um, that are just there to sort um, the recycled rate, the mm. waste that you actually put into your recycling bin. Um, and it's actually quite hideous what some people put in their recycling bins. Um, that, that's all getting dumped onto this conveyor belt. And it goes around this whole factory with different... Uh, kind of infrared technology and magnetic technology and, and hand sorting um, and that only nine percent at the end actually comes mm. out that they could do anything with wow. Goodness. one of my pet hates is like you know you buy something organic right like you buy organic oats for example and then you look on the the plastic thing that you bought it in because that's probably one of the only options there's not many cardboard boxes uh, that you can buy oats in and it says this plastic is not recyclable. And you're like, where are the ethics in that? You know, you, you're making an organic product for people to eat, but then the packaging is not recyclable. It's just, for me, that is super frustrating. There needs to be some sort of matching of, should I, I don't know if ethics is the right word, but if you're eating organic, then at least your packaging should also be kind of organic and, and good for the earth. Yeah, I totally agree. It's so frustrating. You try and do one thing right and you <laughs> kind of get stuck somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, yeah, Craig? I was going to say, but it's almost like what you're saying, it's a thousand micro actions by, by everybody. But, the, the, but what you were saying and what you were saying as well, Gareth, um, is that there's actually like the legislature should also be changed. Like it, it's a two-way, like the individual, like all of us need to do things. But like you say, standardize the one kind of plastic and make sure everyone just has the same playing field. So when you do chuck it in the recycling, everyone chucks it in there, it's straightforward. That's something that, you know, I don't know, I just feel like the, we, the, the government and whatever could be doing more as well um, from, from that side. You know, it's just, it is frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I see it as a three-pronged approach. Uh, there's individual consumers. We need to be really um, choosing the products that have less mm. packaging um, or recyclable packaging. Obviously, we need those products to be on our shelves. So we need industry to be manufacturing our products differently um, and inventing new materials and new processes. And then obviously, we need government to legislate those mm. uh, solutions so that they're then used across all, the whole industry. And those three things need to be happening all at the same time for this to work. Yeah. yeah, tell me about it. Problem, the one problem is, is it all comes down to money, doesn't it? And money just causes mm. greed and and a whole lot of other horrible things off the back of that. But uh, but it's amazing what you're doing, and and you know we would love to uh, get involved in some sort of way, I guess, and, and and a lot of people too. And we'll get onto that in a second. But is it all doom and gloom, or are there like positive things which are changing and happening? I think we've seen such a positive year this last year around plastic. So awareness yeah. has gone through the roof, but we've now got companies every day. There's another company, um, you know, could be uh, accused of jumping on the bandwagon, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that everyone wants to be part of this movement at the moment, but who mm. cares? You know, there's plenty of space. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get everybody uh, working towards it. And, We've now got companies who are making pledges who are saying, you know, we're going to be single use plastic free uh, by 2020. That Sky's pledge at the moment. Um, we've got companies like Adidas, um, this shoe here, uh, which is made from 11 plastic bottles that washed up on a beach in the Maldives from the mm. Indian Ocean. Um, Adidas sold a million pairs of shoes made from ocean plastic last no year. Ways. That's amazing. Um, it is. And they're going to be virgin plastic free by 2024. Wow. 
So a huge company that makes 300 right. million pairs of shoes a year have, you know, said they're going to do it. They've proved they can kind of get some way there. So there's, there's this sort of new playing field really right now for businesses to step up and say, actually, you know, we're in. Um, cool. We, we can be part of this too. And I think the that's companies awesome. that aren't doing that are going to be quickly left behind. Cool. Mm. That's very promising. That's great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emily, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, good question. Um, I think it comes down to being really who you are. I think the thing that I've always uh, um, kind of treasured and protected about myself is being authentic. And as I said earlier about getting to wake up every day and work on the thing that is most important to you and is really being true to yourself. Um, and I think for me, yeah, that's, that's my most human um, kind of trait. Uh, that I, yeah, it's what I do with my time. Uh, which makes me who I am. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, beautiful. That's well said. I think that's very important. Authenticity is something which which seems to lack a little bit uh, these days uh, with uh, social media and stuff. But uh, I also think we're just trying to figure that whole world out still um, anyway. So how can people, say, get involved uh, with what you're doing? How can they help out? Um, how can they find out a bit more about you? Um, and what can we sort of, uh, you know, what can you tell us about things that you're doing going forward? So the big exciting project that we just announced on Friday is that X Expedition is going around the world. Ah, cool. <laughs> this is our next voyage. So um, as we talked about, there's been 11 voyages so far. We've had over 100 women. Uh, take part through those voyages but what's happened is every year we have way more applicants than we can take sailing and mm. this summer in particular we had 500 come through wow. our website and so wow. this is our response we're scaling the project we're setting off on a two-year circumnavigation that will wow. start in October and <laughs> <laughs> it will consist of 30 legs around the world um, so 300 women in total will have a chance to, to go to sea and study plastics and become part of this growing army of people who are creating change on the issue. That's that is amazing. incredible. Will you be there the whole way through? I won't. Uh, this year I've been training an excellent team. They're going to lead most of the project. Um, I will be dipping in and out uh, for various legs. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so is that 300 strong team already chosen? It's not, no. Yes, yeah, so Friday we kind of announced the opening of it um, and then over the next couple of months those teams will be put together. So there is an application form yes. on our website, xexpedition.com. Uh, so that's the word expedition with two X's. Um, if uh, anyone's interested in being part of it. Wow, that's incredible. Great. We, we actually had a guest on our show. Her name is Lizanne van Furen and she was part of... It was called the Coxless Crew. Is that right, Craig? That's right. Yeah. They yeah. Uh, they sailed. They were not sailed. They rode, rode. <laughs> like across the Atlantic. And um, yeah, we'll we'll definitely mention this to her. Maybe it's yeah. something that she's keen to get involved in because she's done one of those ridiculous legs in a row in a rowing boat, which <laughs> yeah. is just the next level is in terms of uh, you know mindsets and um, everything else around that. So so that's cool. Um, Seriously, this has been such a great chat. Um, firstly, it's so nice speaking with you. You know, you haven't stopped smiling the whole chat. <laughs> Just, I can imagine it's, it's rather infectious and that being on your crew, um, it's something which uh, keeps all the other ladies going because I think um, having fun is, is an important part of actually being successful. And Absolutely. Your story has been rather phenomenal and it's just, it's nice. One of the things I noticed or notes I, I heard you speak about was people often ask you, you know, like, how did you get on the path that you are now? Like, was it always part of your, your, um, your decision making and stuff? And, and, or was it something you always visioned? And you said, no, it's actually, I've just looked at the signposts and I followed them. And I think that's such a mm -hmm. awesome way to look at life, you know, and just to, to be conscious that there are signposts, you know, and, and ways and things that are going to tell you what to do. And sometimes there's going to be one that says go here and sometimes there's going to be one that goes there and you just got to 
maybe use your intuition sometimes to know which one is the best one to choose. So I thought that was a lovely way of, of putting things. And your chat is, uh, it's really going to touch a lot of people. And, and what you're doing for me is just amazing. Like I and Craig as well, we're really big into the environment and, and doing our little bits. Um, and what you're doing is, is rather phenomenal. Um, and we can't wait to kind of just see where this next expedition goes. It's super exciting. And uh, thanks for creating awareness in this world because I think the world needs more of that. The world needs more people telling us like what is actually going on? What is the truth? Because there's so much non-truth out there. And then having people that are on the ground, they're the ones that are really able to tell us. So thanks for being one of those people in the world. And um, it's just been a, a really great chat and we wish you all the best going forward. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's been fantastic. Uh, yeah, really delving into some of the intricacies of, uh, of what's happening. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And just real briefly from my side, I think, first of all, as a skipper, you must be the best, I reckon, just lots of fun, like Gareth said, and, and super knowledgeable. But I think you've really got a great um, mix of adventure with science and purpose. And I think that is like such a great combination to actually create real movements. Uh, and I think that's the reason why you've got 500 applicants, which is quite incredible. So uh, I think you've really got this great authentic way of, of doing this. And it's, there's, no, yeah, it, there's no hidden agendas. And, and I think people really gravitate towards that. So um, there's another layer to, to what Gareth already said. I think that um, it just makes it extra special. So we really do celebrate people like yourselves uh, uh, or like yourself um, in this world because it's too easy to just sit back and not know where, what, you, what impact you're having. Um, but to actually take a hard look is actually not easy. And uh, uh, yeah, we really appreciate for you know, people like yourself that are actually showing us, okay, listen, this is what's happening. So keep up the great work, even if it's tough, I'm sure at times, um, it, it is making a difference, will continue to make a difference. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, and, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get some uh, listeners out there who are kind of interested and, and this has uh, helped them think about their next steps. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Cool, cool Emily. That's cool. cool. Great well, chat. Thanks so much. Eh? That was really, a really a great chat. It's, uh, it's very inspiring, um, sure. to you and your story. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. 